If you watch my video reviews, you know that when I'm not reviewing board games, the chances that I'm reviewing a, a dungeon crawl type game are pretty good because that is one of my favorite types of games. As I said in the introduction to one uh, the video, I find dungeon crawling to be a metaphor of life. You work together with some companions as a team, you learn cooperative skills, you need to work together, a team is more than the sum of the parts. By working as a team, you defeat uh, adverse odds, you destroy monsters and steal their treasures. If that is not a metaphor for life, especially modern life, I don't know what is. Even more so, I like if the game is cooperative, fully cooperative, so that all the players are playing against an AI and they can concentrate again on cooperation rather than on scheming and competing against one another. Fun, fun stuff. We have had a lot of dungeon crawlings in the last couple of years, so fully competitive, fully cooperative or not, from the D&D board games, Descent, the Shadows of Brimstone, uh, many of this ilk. And I've enjoyed most dungeon crawlers I've ever played. I may be positively biased towards this genre. Long introduction to say, The Undercity. And the city is a game that I picked up at Genco in 2015. I knew absolutely nothing about it before going to Genco in 2015 and picking up the uh, the catalog, the, um, the big manual that they give you. I don't remember the scientific name. The catalog, the inventory. The manual for Jenkins, and on the back cover there was the advertisement for this game that I knew absolutely zero about. But as soon as I started learning about about it, and uh, and Joel Eddy told me a little bit about it, I was intrigued. It did look like a dungeon crawl type game. It was fully cooperative. All right, that's a bonus. Set in a fantasy universe. I like that. With also a steampunk angle. With a steampunk. Uh, spoon with a spoonful of steampunk stirred in it and steampunk is not my first thing to go but is not uh, unwelcome either so the undercity look like a game where I could control some heroes and send them down a dungeon to complete missions in a crazy world full of magic strange effects and monsters I had to try. So even though I didn't know much about it, it was a bit of an impulse buy, but buy it I did, play it I did too, and in this video I'm going to tell you about my impressions after playing The Undercity. This is the board of the game. The board is kind of neutral, it is just divided in squares, but then there are terrain tiles that you place according to scenario instructions to transform the neutral basic board into a variety of different places for different encounters. Actually here you see the game in the middle of one of the scenarios, so scenario 5, or I should say chapter 5, that's how the scenarios are called in the, in the scenario book and I wanted to show you this to give you a sense of how the game may look in the middle of a game with the protagonists that the players will control in various areas of the board uh, villains these are represented by the miniatures that you see here the red and blue miniatures there aren't many at the present time but many more are scheduled to come that's the reinforcement area for the villains then you have, as I said, terrain tiles that represent different types of terrain, impassable terrain, difficult terrain, side quest cards. Uh, the scenario instructions will tell you how to set up a side quest deck. You form the deck, then you shuffle the cards, and then you will place some of these cards face down in various areas of the board. Some of the side quests for this uh, specific scenario have already been used. One is still here. Side quest cards are revealed when a character enters the area, and they may trigger different types of effects. So loot that you uh, recover, different types of encounters, things like that. In this scenario specifically, uh, again to give a sense of how scenario may work, the hero started from here, there were monsters in various locations that started attacking the heroes. The heroes needed to thin out the defenses of the opponents and to start sealing these gates. So, these areas that you see here are gates that the enemies use to enter the board. The mission in this scenario is to escort that uh, 
alchemist from his lab, which is there, to the gate in that area. But the guy is kind of like not particularly sure about uh, why it is to walk through this dangerous area, so he's waiting for at least two of the gates to be sealed. That is, the players need to seal at least two of the gates, make the area a little safer, then it'll feel more comfortable to come out. And at that point, after sealing two gates, the players can escort him uh, to that area. If they manage to do so and there are no monsters there, they win the scenario. But, uh, well, the enemies are certainly going to try to stop them from doing so. Now, let's take a look at the characters that the players control. Characters are represented on the board by miniatures, pretty detailed, high quality miniatures that frankly you probably don't even need to paint. I don't paint miniatures and in this case I don't feel the need to paint them or to hire somebody to paint them for me because those miniatures look pretty good and detailed already. Each character is represented, as I said, by a miniature and a corresponding card. This is the card with the stats for her. There are a lot of stats, as you can imagine, to tell you what the character can do and the level of experience of the character. Stats are vitality, when it goes down to zero, the character is uh, is passed out well it's incapacitated then it will start soon losing life tokens permanently when you take a wand your life tokens are flipped to this side when you're incapacitated then you actually start losing life tokens which means that even if you're revived then it is only the remaining tokens that are flipped face up so once you're incapacitated even if you then come back to action you'll be weaker than before Strength, intelligent, perception, used for various types of tests, and then very important for combat, defense and armor. Defense, the ability to dodge hits, and armor, the ability to resist hits when you are in fact hit. When the hit an opponent reaches you, it may still not go through your armor. Then you have initiative that tells you the order in which the characters will act in a turn, and then the weapons that they can use, which may be ranged or melee, and weapons have a range, that is important again for range, weapons, melee weapons have a zero. Accuracy and power. Accuracy may, indicating how likely it is that the weapon used by the carter will hit, and power, how lucky it is, likely it is that the weapon will deal damage. Carters have life tokens, indicating their vitality, then they also had two important decks. One is a deck of abilities. Abilities can be purchased during the campaign, spending experience points that the characters will earn. As you can see, here's the cost. And there are various types of advantages that may, may be uh, acquired through the ability deck by acquiring new ability cards. Here, for example, we have some abilities that this character has acquired already and that she did not have at the beginning of the campaign. So you can pause and read the text if you want to have more information about that. But also very important is another deck of cards that each character has. You can see these decks are personalized. A deck of feet cards. These represent special actions that the character can perform. Each feed card has possible effects that can be used when the feed card is spent. You start with a hand of feed cards, you spend feed cards when you use the corresponding feed, and you will draw a new feed at the beginning, at the end of each of your activations. Each card also has some special abilities. For example, she is a gun mage duelist, so she shoots with a gun, but her gun does weird stuff. So each time that you attack, you choose which of these effects you want to use. Also, she has a feat effect, which is once per round, uh, when you control this card, you can discard a feat card, any one, to make an additional range attack against another target in the same space as your first range target. This is similar to what other characters have, which is they have abilities that are based on discarding feed cards. So basically you can use your feed cards for the printed effect or you can use them as general resources, burning them to have that feed effects. Also, 
you have for each character a second wind ability which usually uh, gives some form of advantages when things are not going too well. For example, the first time that a character drops down to a certain amount of health, uh, a positive effect may be triggered. When a character misses a certain effect, can be triggered. Je definitely uh, these are sort of like consolation prizes that you get when things are not going too well in other departments. Now let's have a look at the board and see how a turn works. At the beginning of a turn you draw a card from the event deck and the event deck is set up based on scenario instructions. Different scenarios will have different events. You flip a card from the event deck face up at the beginning of each turn and you simply implement the effect. Sometimes there's no effect, sometimes other stuff that you need to resolve immediately. For example here the devil rats come out of the woodwork and now every character in a space with no other figures makes an hazard roll. Hazard roll is a generic term for a roll that indicates well various types of bad stuff that may happen. It's a generic procedure, a generic test. You roll a d6, if you roll a 5 or a 6 then you take damage from the hazard. You also have an hazard roll if, for example, you're leaving an area with an enemy, then enemies can attempt to attack you. Hazard rolls in that case an abstract way of indicating wounds that you may take if you're leaving an area with enemies in it, and there may be other effects that inflict hazard rolls on you. So you resolve the event. Events also are color coded. There are some red events like that one there because you can see from the red on the bands of the card and there are some other ones that are blue events. Uh, the color code simply indicates certain priorities when effects are triggered and in particular when reinforcements are brought in. There may be things that say, you know, follow the color priority and add the reinforcements of the color priority for the term. Then you would use the miniature for that specific color priority. Other than that, usually when um, enemies, uh, enemies are represented by blue or red miniatures, color doesn't really affect the performance of the model, just it is a way of coding certain, uh, certain situations and coding timing for activations and actions for the villains. So, at the beginning of the turn you resolve an event, then the characters will take their turns. So at the beginning of each character's turn you actually spawn a new villain. You roll two dice, one to determine the type of villain that is spawned and one to determine where it will be spawned. And you look at that area where you have the reinforcements for the villains. You see those tokens, they indicate the number that it takes to spawn a certain villain. I rolled a three for example. During my spawn, spawning roll, that means that the villain of that type will be activated, indicated by that number. As you can see, there are tokens that can be organized in different ways, in different scenarios, to indicate various types of villains and how likely it is that a certain villain will be spawned. These two villains, for example, are more likely to be spawned in this scenario than these two vill villains here. So we have this roll indicating that one of those villains will be spawned and then we have this indicating the area and you look at the area on the board with that number. Again the game comes with tiles with different numbers and different ranges of numbers that in different scenarios will be placed in different locations. Here for example we add a villain of the type 3 to the gate number 6 which is there. There we go. After we spawn a new villain, we activate the hero. Actually, another important thing, if the villain cannot be spawned for whatever reason, for example, there aren't any left in the reserve, then the hero activates a villain which is the farthest from the hero. I'll talk about activating villains later. Then the hero finally can take an action, but suppose we're activating this guy. To take an action, or better to activate the hero, the hero can move and take an action. Movement can be of three types. You can move by zero, you can hold, so you don't move, in which case you get a bonus if you're performing a range attack because you're able to aim an attack. Or you can move by one and still perform a range attack. Or you can move by one or two 
charging, that's called charging, and if you are charging and moving in an area that uh, contains enemy figures, so you resolve melee, if you're charging then you get a boost on your damage roll. Boosting means that you add a die to whatever pool of dice you're rolling. Suppose I'm rolling an attack, which is 2d6, so there is an effect that boosts that attack, then I get an extra d6. Or maybe I'm rolling later to determine damage, and the damage usually is 2d6, but I have an effect that boosts the damage, then it is the damage pool of dice that gets an extra die roll. So when you're charging, if you hit, you get, get to boost your damage roll. Move and perform an action, as I said. Actions can be to perform an attack, and it can be a range attack, it can be a melee attack. When you're attacking, you can use any and all of your weapons or the type of attack that you're performing. So you can use your range weapons or your melee weapons, depending on the type of attack that you're resolving. Other actions are, for example, to revive a carter. Yes, if there's a carter that is incapacitated, you can use an alchemical potion, an alchemical restorative to restore the carter and of course you empty the thing but at least your carter is back to where the carter was before well not necessarily it may be weakened by uh, the re <clears throat> by the by being brought back but at least the carter is alive there may also be specific challenges that you need to take in order to perform actions on the board and in which case the action that you perform after moving may be to take a certain challenge. For example, in this scenario you're trying to close gates and to close a gate you need to take an intelligence or strength challenge of difficulty 12 which means you can spend your action, you roll 2d6, you add your stat for that challenge, for example in a strength challenge you would add a 4, in an intelligent challenge she would add a 5, and if the modified result is equal to or higher than the level of the challenge, then you win the challenge. But the point is that attempting a stat challenge, a challenge based on one of your stats, is, is an action. Now, let's talk about combat, because I know that that's what gets everybody excited. To resolve combat, well, you resolved it in two phases. First, you roll to attack, and then if you did hit, you roll to uh, see uh, if you were able to actually penetrate the armor of the opponent. Suppose that she is attacking one of these crossbow thugs. Each villain has a card indicating the stats. The vitality of most villains is one, which means a single hit takes them down. To attack, you roll usually 2d6, uh, the attack may be boosted by game effects, there may be other things that modify the number of dice that you roll. But the general idea is that you roll 2d6, you add the stat, uh, the accuracy stat for the weapon that you are using, in this case you would have 9, she's firing at them, plus 5, we have 14. If the total is equal to or higher than the defense of the opponent, you do score a hit. So that's a hit. The, the attack did reach the target, but did it penetrate the armor? Then you roll again, 2d6, uh, maybe boosted by game effects, uh, many things may affect that. But the point is that you roll 2d6, uh, you add the power of the weapon, in this case we have 18, and if the attack is higher than the armor of the opponent, then the attack not only was that successful, but the attack also did go through and inflicts a hit on the opponent. Actually, if you manage to exceed the armor of the target by 5 or more, you inflict 2 points of damage, not just 1. And this is, well, the basic idea. Uh, with melee, it works the same way. You just use the stats of accuracy and power for your, um, for your melee weapons. It looks pretty basic in a sense it is, but there is a lot that is added to this basic engine by the enormous amount of special effects, weapons, armor, situations, spells, runes, crazy stuff that is brought to the fore by all of the game effects. So your character activates and then the villains take an action. There is a villain action deck at the end of the activation of a character. You flip the villain, the villain action card from a deck that you form based on scenario instructions. And you simply follow the instructions. This would activate up to two red villains closest to you. 
um, activate the three villains farthest from you, two villains closest to you. So as you can see, sometimes it's color coded, sometimes it's based on position, various things, uh, sometimes it's based on a specific type of enemy. So you don't know exactly who is going to activate uh, crossbow thugs and so on and so forth. When you activate a villain, you look at the card for the villain and that will tell you the priority of actions that the villain take. You start from this icon here, this is the, uh, the list of actions that they take in priority order from left to right. You look at the first icon that indicates the thing that they will try to do. If they cannot do that, then they will perform the next and then the next. In this case, for example, if the thug can perform an aim fire, it will do that. If that is not possible, then the villain will move and then perform regular fire. Otherwise, the villain will try to pursue the opponent. When villains attack you, they follow the same procedure as you did when you were attacking them, which is roll for accuracy and then roll potentially for damage if the accuracy roll was a success. So this is basically the uh, player's turn. You spawn a villain, you activate movement and an action, then a villain takes an action, you repeat the procedure for the next hero until all heroes have activated. At that point, the round is over, you start a new one, you draw a new event, resolve the event, and proceed again to activate all of your heroes one at a time. So on and so forth until either the players meet the victory conditions of the scenario, in which case, guess what, they win, otherwise they lose the game. So the Undercity is exactly what I expect it would be, uh, which is good when you know that I'm biased towards this genre, so I usually think I'm gonna like them. I like, I did like this game, I enjoyed it, definitely enjoyed it. It has all the things that I like in this type of game. It has a strong story, a strong narrative, it has a good tactical feel, while at the same time also building a story around the simple mechanics of combat. Uh, to me, even though I play a lot of games based on combat, that's most of the games that I play, uh, combat is never just about combat, it's never just about abstract impacts, it is about the struggle and the drama and the tragedy and the story and the motivations and the tough decisions that are behind the simple impact of forces involved in a combat. And this is why I like games at the skirmish level so much, because you do have pure combat and you also see, still see the faces of the characters, still see the personality of the characters. The other city really shines in that. Um, I don't know anything about the world behind the Iron Kingdoms, I believe. Uh, that's a franchise that had an RPG based on before. If not, if they made this up just entirely for this game, they clearly made a lot of work in creating a background that was in interesting, intriguing, and definitely felt like it had some depth and a lot of thematic richness. Not knowing anything about this world, which in a certain sense is a privileged position for a reviewer, so I can give you uh, my purest and unbiased impression. This is a world that is fascinating. I like the dark, gloomy aspects of it uh, that just work well in modern fantasy. We tend to have brooding fantasy these days, and I guess that's what appeals to us, and the game responds to that. Yet, there is a little bit of irony here and there in the art, in the effects, in the design of the characters. You have a little bit of that old Star Wars uh, Indiana Jones Z uh, feel to it. So the monsters look scary, but the adventurers will also look scary. They look kind of like they're having fun doing the crazy stuff that they do. There is a little bit of that uh, of, of that free adventure feel of I would say taste for adventure, enjoyment for adventure that I definitely enjoy. So you have that the, just the, the the sense of wonder and the journey for the adventure and you had the dark dungeon and it all works pretty well thematically. The story the atmosphere is definitely definitely there and they're an important part of the element. As you're guiding your mercenaries down the scary places of the undercity, 
completing different missions, which you can link in a campaign or you can play as one shot. They can definitely play it that way. Even though the rulebook does recommend that you play the scenarios as a campaign, nothing prevents you from jumping in, uh, playing scenario four or scenario six. You have, I believe, seven scenarios in uh, the scenario book. All you to do simply is you adjust your characters, giving them a certain amount of experience points that you spend. Those are the experience points that approximately the characters would have gained if they had gone through all of the scenarios in the campaign up to that point. So I like the fact that you can jump in at any point in the campaign if you want to play one shot scenarios and you can do so. The scenarios are pretty different from one another. There is a much welcome variety in the scenarios and the challenges that they present. If anything I had to say, the first scenario is a little underwhelming. Yes, you could expect that to be the training scenario, the introduction scenario, and that that's what it is. There are games in which the introductory scenario also is a blast to play. This one is an introduction, it does that job well, but it feels a little bland because it's one big room, you're there, the enemies arrive from different directions, boom, 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 you shoot, you shoot, you fire, you fire, you defend, you defend, you attack, you attack, you repeat, you repeat. It feels uh, a little repetitive and a little dry. It's, it is also pretty basic tactically later scenarios become much more interesting and uh, so don't be discouraged if the first scenario feels a little flat you will learn how the game is played and then you have scenarios where the tactical space is much more interesting the terrain is more interesting maneuvering around obstacles and finding the right time to pop out of a corner with one character coming out of another with another character combining an effect comboing a certain action with another action all those things in later scenarios will pay off. Uh, also in later scenarios your characters will have been customized either through going by going through the previous scenarios or simply using experience points that you receive if you start the scenario without going through the previous ones. Either way your, your characters will be customized, they will have more complex combos of effects which may change from game to game so all that tends to make the tactical situation on the board much more interesting, adds to the flavor, adds to the theme, adds to the experience. I definitely enjoyed the game, uh, I like that it's a cooperative game, you play against the AI of the board, that means that you can also play the game solitaire. The game however always has three to four characters, so if you're playing with two players, get used to the idea of controlling multiple characters, you can play solitaire controlling all of the characters, I don't think there is any problem in that for players that are uh, familiar with solitaire play other players may have a bit more of a hard time adjusting to that but most players I believe will in any case buy this for uh, multiplayer gaming so not a problem there. Cooperative gaming it already takes away a lot of problems, a lot of tension you may have when a side plays the overlord and the other player is the team. I really like it when all the players are at the same time and working together on the same side and playing together towards the same objective. So it's a challenge for the players against the board and the AI of the board. The challenge is not that hard if you play the game at the level of difficulty that the scenarios are designed for. Um, this is not super challenging, the scenarios are not that hard to beat. Uh, however, there are plenty of ways suggested in the scenario book and there are other ways that you can easily come up with to make the game as tough and mean and deadly as you want it to be. Make the monster tougher, weaken your characters, give them less resources. There are a lot of ways that you can use to tweak the game and make it as complex and challenging as you want it to be. The Undercity, what can I say? Yes, there are many games like this one, but this one is mine. Uh, there are many games like this one with the general philosophy, but this one has its own personality. It doesn't feel like a tight repetition of many uh, ideas that we've seen before. Yes, there are many ideas here that you've seen before, but it doesn't feel like a tight repetition. It feels like an inspired, a passionate, and a pretty vivid and exciting re-implementation of many classical ideas of classic uh, dungeon crawl games. In general, a really, a really good example, a really good new uh, 
element, a really new hair in that family. In any case, a good game, one that I'm glad to add to my collection of dungeon crawl games. And now I would like to take a moment to thank some backers of my Kickstarter campaign for 2015. They donated to the campaign and made it possible for me to acquire some of the games they purchased recently and I am reviewing these days. Like good enchanters and wizards in a fantasy game, they stepped in in the moment of need, lent a hand and saved the day. The backers that I want to thank today are Lorinda Gale, the Enchantress. Raymond Lee, the Necromancer, Rick Thompson, the Wizard, and the Cardboard, the Jungle, the Mysterious Mage. Yes, he wrote the Jungle Cardboard because he scrambled the parts of his name around. He doesn't want the evil wizards to learn his name because there's great power in a name. Anyways, thank you to the four of you for donating to my campaign and thank you all my viewers for watching.